Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here opening this uh, section on open data and data protection. And um, I, I, I first have to, to read uh, the, the one, one disclaimer. Uh, I don't know what it is, uh, the disclaimer uh, about everybody participating in the, uh, I, I can't find it, but they, they'll show it on, on, on the screen, I guess. But just to thank you very much, all the participants, uh, and uh, I'm happy to hear now. And uh, I'll, 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 read it. I'll, I'll read the screen right now. All manifestations expressed by staff members of Fundação Getúlio Vargas and by participating guests represent exclusively their own opinions and thoughts. Therefore, do not represent the institutional no position of FGV. We also reiterate that all those present here have agreed to participate in the event spontaneously and have authorized the use of their image for the live transmission as well as for the post event video on FGV's official channels. So uh, saying that, uh, I, I just like to welcome, I think this is a, a, a top uh, issue right now uh, about uh, open data and how to protect uh, uh, personal information. And uh, I think we, 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 we've we have done a lot uh, with, with open data. We, we, uh, we are gaining efficiency, we're gaining in transparency and accountability. But uh, if we forget about uh, how to protect personal information, we, we may end up uh, in trouble or even uh, taking away all the gains that we have done. So you have a really top team with us right now. And I'll, I'll just pass it over to Alexandre that will uh, tell you a little bit more about our participants today. And I hope you do enjoy uh, our presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Ciro. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexandre Pacheco da Silva. I'm a law professor at São Paulo Law School uh, at Getúlio Vargas Foundation, and I coordinate uh, the Center for Education and Research in Innovation at FGV. It is a pleasure to be a part of this event. Uh, I thank Professor, uh, Professor Ciro Biderman, Patricia Gomes for the invite, and I feel this topic to be uh, special for two reasons. First, because of the intellectual challenge that uh, the topic inspires. Data is, a, is an essential part of my work. I teach courses in data protection, intellectual property, digital law. And one important question is how can we create a balance between privacy law and open data policies in governments? Not only in governments, but let's start with governments, especially in partnerships that we uh, will explore further. And I would like to hear a lot from our guests today. But second, uh, because uh, in my view, public authorities in Brazil do not realize the complexity uh, of their task to create public policies that comply with their new data protection obligations. That is a huge challenge for our, our country. I imagine that this is a, a very uh, complex challenge for other countries as well. And uh, I also uh, am thrilled to uh, be a part of this event and to hear uh, the thoughts and the uh, ideas from our guests today. Uh, and I know it's uh, uh, and I know it's not easy to develop uh, public policies for housing, transportation, health in bigger cities. Uh, I will not uh, uh, comment on each one of the challenges of those sectors, but I uh, know uh, and I assume that is a complex a complex task to to do it so. But when we think about that with more than, uh, with cities, with more than 10 million cities living there. This is not only a, a complex task, but this is uh, an opportunity to, to build projects that will uh, enhance, will increase the quality of uh, the lives of uh, those citizens. So it is even harder when uh, this uh, public policies intend to create uh, what we call uh, a smart city. Uh, 
uh, even uh, when uh, the idea of a smart city of what it is uh, a smart city uh, means in, the, in this context. And uh, when we think about that, uh, we can say that if you read a lot of papers and discuss with a lot of uh, professor regard, professors regarding that topic, we will see that this concept of what is smart and how can we create a smart city is under dispute. But one good example to illustrate uh, how countries are uh, more or less prepared regarding this topic is a, a, a recent uh, a security incident that we had in Brazil that is a, a ransomware attack uh, to a Brazilian high court, not only to a Brazilian high court, but other uh, uh, data sets that we have in different branches of uh, our government that were uh, hacked and uh, the court uh, systems were encrypted, blocked, and the Brazilian authorities are still discussing what will be a good response for this uh, episode. When we think about that, imagine that for a smart city, Imagine that you could have a blackout in services, uh, in transportation, in health, in housing, if we are not prepared to not only protect the data from uh, the citizens, but actually uh, create a city that will work not only with technology, but will work in a way that uh, the city will be uh, smart, will be intelligent, and will deliver uh, service with data, uh, with information, so on and so forth. So the first idea that I would like to, to share and the first perception that uh, I have about the subject of uh, open data and data protection is that governments are naturally involved in many activities that re require substantial gathering and processing of personal data. Uh, and when we think about that, uh, and when we think about this position that uh, the governments uh, are in, we can say that also, when it comes to obtaining significant intelligence from such data, they are typically associated with private partners. This is not a, a thing that they need to do in uh, every case, but usually when we see those projects, we see that they uh, actually associate with pri pri private partners and we must ask ourselves what would be a good structure to govern, to govern these kind of partnerships. And such partnerships uh, have a unique challenge of balance, uh, balancing uh, wide access to personal data collected by the government with the privacy of the data subject to pri the, the privacy of the individuals. And in my view, uh, there is a tension between the interest and expectation of data collectors, either if we are talking about government authorities or private entities, and the rights and expectations of the data subject. The first one regards transparency. Uh, in a sea of information about individuals, what would be a good quantity and quality of information that must be available for the data subject? That is a huge uh, uh, challenge to uh, build projects uh, uh, in, uh, with governments and uh, private entities. Secondly, data governance. To enjoy the benefits of digitalization and automation, governments around the world are develop, uh, developing new policies oriented by collecting and analyzing data. In some, case, in some cases, sharing the data with several actors from the private sector. It is more and more important to disclose uh, their plan, how they coordinate digital resources what are the safeguards to the citizens, uh, so on and so forth. And finally, the third one concerns security. In a digitalized world, what are the measures put in place to guarantee th that the personal data from individuals are protected from hacks, data breaches, and other incidents? When we place uh, these questions in the context of smart cities, we add a new layer of complexity. First, considering that the smart means more technology, which is not uh, true in several scenarios. Second is to consider that smart cities can allow a lot of room for commercial, commercial secrecy when personal data is being used, which is not acceptable in, uh, acceptable in many cases. 
even though the concept of smart cities in, in, uh, is in dispute, it is important that we are able to create paths to allow us to balance privacy rights and uses of data by public authorities. I'm really, really glad to uh, have the opportunity to moderate this session with great scholars that have important contributions to this debate. And, I will be, and this will be a great chance to listen and learn with their ideas and discuss the tensions between data protection regulations and the uses of data by the public sector. We need to, to uh, uh, create a model to uh, balance protection with potential uses of this data to create cities that could uh, enhance the well-being of uh, the citizens all around the world. So to do that and to have this privilege, to share this privilege with our uh, audience, we divided this session in 20 minutes presentation by we by each one of our guests and I in a, a final round of 30 minutes for questions from the audience and from myself and other researchers that are a part of this, this event. We prepared some questions, but we will, uh, of course, uh, uh, have a preference to the questions coming from the audience because we want to interact with you guys. So just a quick remind, a reminder for our audience, the questions needed to be sent by a link in the description below, and you can use the Slido platform. Just write a question, send to us, we will gather the questions and we will uh, ask our guests uh, each one of the questions that you present to us during this event. Uh, so let us start with Rafael Zanata. I have a, a brief introduction, uh, a, a brief bio uh, from Rafael, but Rafael, feel free to uh, add something that I miss in this description. Rafael Zanata is the director from uh, director of Data Privacy Brazil Research Association. He was the digital rights program coordinator uh, at the Brazilian Institute for Consumer Protection between 2015 and 2018 leader of uh, Internet Lab project and researcher at Sao Paulo Law School of Getúlio Vargas Foundation. He actively uh, participated uh, in the construction of the general law for personal data protection in Brazil and in the public hearings about Marco Civil the Internet, uh, Brazilian framework for internet regulation at the Congress and Supreme Court. Thank you very much to be uh, here with us uh, today, Rafael, and the floor is yours to your presentation and for your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pacheco. Can you hear me well? Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah, so, it's perfect. Um, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. It's truly a pleasure. Um, it's a very hard topic, and I chose to frame the discussion in terms of a delicate dance because I don't even know if it's possible to reach like a perfect balance between open data and personal data. But maybe it's about a set of new movements and learning how to set up this new delicate dance using the expression of um, philosopher Anita Allen, privacy philosopher. Um, well, let me explain about the organization and then move on about what we do and and then frame the questions in, in terms of how we've been discussing about open data in Brazil, which has been mainly about the public sector, and what would be the limits to enlarge that to the private sector, also considering the data protection law. Um, as Pacheco said, we are a new NGO founded this year, and we've been doing, been doing research and advocacy on the intersection between technologies and the use of data. Uh, we have a new project and then we've been actively engaging with the with the courts. Uh, we participated in the Supreme Court ruling of the EPGA case, uh, really strong precedent about personal data protection as a fundamental right. And we've been concerned about shape, shaping the way and helping the regulators and judges to think about uh, personal data, which is quite complex. Pacheco knows we've been working in this field for many, many years. Uh, I know Pacheco at least since 2013, when he was already a privacy scholar, 
And despite the fact that we have this big community of digital rights in Brazil and a lot of knowledge about privacy and personal data, when you go to courts or regulators, they still know very little about the subject. So there's a lot of work to do here. We have these different research areas. That I will not explain all of them, but we've, we've been highly concerned about methodologies for impact assessment, which is something that I want to connect with my uh, discussion today. And I believe Kelsey and others will also uh, talk about this because it's super important how to do methodologies to uh, measure the risks of opening the data when you consider privacy and data protection. We have published books, policy papers. There's an Instagram account with a lot of content. There's a podcast. So it just invites you guys to get to know everything that the NGO and, and the school is doing. And there's this uh, observatory, which is uh, has a memory of the Brazilian data protection law. For those of you that do not know the history of the Brazilian data protection law, there is going to be a documentary with English transcriptions about how it was built, what was the uh, challenges, the fights um, like for or against the legislation and the different opinions. And, and most of all, how this really beautiful coalition came up in 2018 uh, which was unique. Remember, for Chico, more than 80 organizations from different sectors, activists, uh, private firms, members of the government, uh, reaching consensus about the legislation and, and making sure that the Congress would enact it. Uh, so this was truly a remarkable moment of our democracy in which we could build things together. Um, well, let me begin with a, a conceptual um, question about information as infrastructure for social good. Uh, and we know there has been a lot of debates in the past 15 years about information as infrastructure or trying to frame information or data as knowledge commons or as a certain type of commons. And you have the work of Brad Frischman, you have the work of a lot of people drawing in the concepts of Eleanor Ostrom and Charlotte Haas and scholars from the field of common pool resources. And they've all been trying to push this idea that data and information could be treated as a kind of a shared infrastructure or shared resource in order to promote cooperation, complex human motivation, and, and projects that could be collectively shared. And you have the whole commons movement, data commons movement in Europe but tries to show that there are really different approaches in how you can understand information and data. If you go to a more like, proprietary approach, um, only focus on private property or individual control of personal data and information. These are, are ideas that set up the, the scene for a kind of a market in, in which you can be paid for your data or you can only individually control your data. But these other ideas about commons and information as an infrastructure, they do not care about setting up new private property rights for data, but it's all about understanding the governance structures and how data could be collectively used and the, the right to use or to access or to exclude could be collectively developed. This is highly complex. I mean, it was. It, it was complex already for the environmental uh, field when you talked about communities dealing with a collective resource like a river or a forest. Imagine talking about data, personal data or information or even the internet, which are like truly uh, global and complex issues that you, you cannot know precisely who are the participants, who are the members, how can you design these uh, rules for access, control and exclusion. So we have been debating for a very long time and no one came up with a clear solution on how to really design systems in which uh, information and personal data could be treated as infrastructure. But the idea is there for 15 years, right? And you have this discussions, data as commons or data commons as well uh, being presented and which was a, 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 an idea that was uh, only, you could reach that idea in scholarship in academia, but suddenly became something bigger than that. And if you read, if you read the report of Cédric Villani from the uh, French 
Congress talking about a meaningful artificial intelligence and the plan of Macron and, and, the, the, and French politicians about the strategy for France for 21st century, they explicitly talk about um, the, the way in which the state can be a, a third trusted party and public authorities should introduce and they should make sure that you have uh, data pools, uh, regulatory structure for sharing data, and they even talk about imposing openness on certain data of public interest, such as transportation or health, just to give two examples. This also connects, not directly, but in a particular way, with the work of Roberto Mangabeira Unger, a philo Brazilian philosopher that we all know very well. He's very linked to FGV, he's very linked to Brazilian uh, uh, intelligentsia, so to speak. And in his latest book, The Knowledge Economy, he makes a strong claim about an approach to the inclusive vanguardism in the knowledge economy and making sure that we could reconstruct property rights and experiment institutionally in this kind of a collective exercise of powers, control, and access. So he's talking about really reshaping intellectual and property rights in a collective way, uh, not only in the traditional forms and, and not only limited to the approaches of uh, privacy and data protection law, but still highly abstract and not clear ideas on, on how to do it. These are the whole intellectual framework of his discussion. And I, I don't have time, but I have been researching, and there's a lot of projects and names and proposals uh, to, you know, to, to develop public data trusts, private data trusts, data commons or data co-ops. I was in the U.S. last year in the in a conference at the New School in November, and I met uh, entrepreneurs and people that were developing data co-ops for health. Really small businesses, but truly amazing in the sense that they were concerned about making sure that they had an institutional framework in which people could somehow donate their data and they could be collectively shared as a data co-op and the data co-op could negotiate on how the data could be used collectively. And you have also new projects like Tim Berners-Lee have been advocating for the SOLID project and new uh, frameworks and technical frameworks to make sure that you have personal data stores and traceability of the data uh, that has been produced by data subjects so you can have somehow uh, not only a market for these transactions of personal data, but also mechanisms for new forms of intermediaries like NGOs or associations or trusted parties that could be responsible for deciding collectively on how the data could be used. A lot of ideas in the air, but in Brazil, unfortunately, none of these highly sophisticated ideas are being developed. In my opinion, when we when we look at the Brazilian approach for open data, all this sophisticated and abstract idea of opening the data or imposing openness for certain fields of the economy, they do not have so much ground. And here, in fact, what we do have is a very strong approach of open data for government. This is true, but not the, the previous idea that was explained. So we have the open government partnership with Brazil with a strong commitment on making sure that they can, they can advance open government and open data, uh, the Ministry of Planning and Budget and Infrastructure being respons responsible for making sure that they can fulfill these commitments. Uh, a lot of um, commitments that you can access in their website on how they are structuring since 2013, this uh, culture of open data inside the government, uh, drafting new resolutions and norms to make sure that federal governments can publish things in interoper interoperable ways and making sure that the community of open data can grow based on this uh, culture from within the government. So basically we have very strong focus on public sector, a lot of interaction between NGOs, technical community like W3C, the federal government, legislation like the Freedom of Information Act and, a lot, and, and other norms for open data in the public sector, and also a lot of impact on regulatory agencies. For instance, the Federal Agency of Telecommunications, Anatel, has a very strong policy on open data uh, in, in which they open up and show the data of the sector, but basically data that they possess as regulators, as a state. Um, 
And there is a big community of activists, journalists, and public interest technologies working on the, on the data in Brazil. But in my opinion, they are mostly focused on government open data. Very limited focus on open data for the private sectors in terms of economic intervention and regulation, and very limited projects on data commons. Well, what about open personal data? It would be crazy to talk about open personal data. This is a paper that I wrote with Ricardo Bramovai at the University of Sao Paulo, in which we talk about how to like, contest, how to challenge this claim that personal uh, data protection and open data are not fit. Because sometimes they, you can hear this claim. Well, they're not fit. You cannot have, at the same time, open data with uh, data protection. Indeed, we had a long way for the personal data protection in Brazil. Sorry, Kelsey, and others for the part in below, which is in Portuguese, but it's been a long period of more than 10 years now since it began the consultation in the public hearings about enacting legislation on data protection, which is very close to GDPR, so to speak, very principles-based, very uh, based on the ideas in which the controller must have obligations like ex ante obligations of demonstrating that they have legal grounds for processing data and a lot of new uh, rights, data rights for the subjects that can access, they can demand for portability, they can demand for the explanation of automated decision making. And a lot of principles in this legislation, like purpose, limitation, transparency, uh, security of information, and, and so on. It was a long walk and it's a truly remarkable victory of the Brazilian civil society having this legislation. At the same time, legislation is very clever and it only began being effective last month, uh, now two months, right, September, um, in which has a whole chapter on partnerships of the public sector with the private sector for the use of data. And it has two articles which I like very much. First one, which says that the data from the public sector must be contained in interoperable and structured for shared use. So this idea of incentives for the shared use of this data with the idea of decentralization of the public activity with partnerships and shared use of the personal data by, by the public power uh, only if you have specific purposes. This will create a lot of trouble when you have innovation that might challenge the previous purpose that you had before. Because in dynamic scenarios in which you can somehow try to experiment with the use of data for new things, for new projects, with a lot of partners, uh, you cannot find the original purpose anymore. So there is this big discussion that we had with Professor Dennis Hirsch. He was here last year in our seminar on, on privacy and data protection, and he would say, well, it's troublesome for big data and innovation in open data when you have the, the strong rule of purpose limitation. How can we deal with this flexible balance of purpose limitation? This is a very important question, because Brazil has a strong uh, principle of, of purpose limitation. Well, I think we have... Um, when we wrote, wrote this paper, we were looking for some examples from MobiLab and from the open banking, trying to say that these were examples in which you had projects for opening the data in a limited way, in a controlled scenario, and you were already concerned about privacy and data protection. And this could be examples to consider that this, this was these were policies of open personal data. Uh, so MobiLab, as Cito has a lot of experience in this, and you, you guys know, uh, in our opinion, was one of the pioneers of um, advancing this idea in which you can use the structure of the state to generate economic poten potential from raw data from the public sector and structuring collaboration schemes for participants to join, to have the access of this data, and to develop new projects based on this uh, uh, data set that you had before that was not being used for new things. So try to, at the same time, uh, you can not, not only achieve transparency and openness, but it's truly about like economic incentives of trying to uh, make sure that people can innovate and develop new projects. A lot of examples that came up after the opening of the data of the buses and a lot of examples of concerns from MobiLab 
on how they were uh, anonymiz doing anonymization of the data in order to make sure that there was no um, high risks for this type of data. At the same time, we know that there are a lot of discussions about the impossibility of truly anonymization and this balance in which the more that you want to reach value from personal data, the less you can anonymize. So how can you uh, work with this paradox? But we have, and, and, and here I quote Ricardo Abramovay, professor of economics at the University of Sao Paulo, saying that, well, things are not colliding. Actually, they're focused on the same issues, open data and personal data protection are about trust and solidarity and social ties in our community. So there should not be a trade-off. Uh, we, we should work harder on how to achieve both. Well, the UK report that was published last year that was discussed in Brazil at, in, in many meetings that we had with one, one of the writers, the Unlocking Digital Economy, it's interesting because they use a strong argument of data mobility, that the government should pursue the mobility of personal data the government should structure open standards to foster competition. And the government should encourage the publication of public service data and also to select some economic sectors in which they should impose like, openness of data. This, of course, it is a strong form of state intervention in the private sector, and it has been challenged before. Let's remember the example of Uber in Sao Paulo. When the City Hall of Sao Paulo were trying to Collect data to urban planning, and they were imposing the data sharing from uh, private firms like Uber. One of the arguments, one of the claims of, of Uber were, was like, Well, <clears throat> I'm not obliged to share this data, and you as a city hall cannot impose new forms of economic intervention like this. Only the federal government should. So in Brazil, it's more complex than that because when you go to the municipal level, we do not have the same legal structure as, as in the US or in other countries. We have a limited uh, set of powers at the municipal level to shape economic regulation. It's all, always possible to challenge that as it occurred in the past. I think this, just to, 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 to close my, my speak, um, one of the interesting frameworks is about um, open privacy, as has been discussed in the, in the US, and methodologies to reach cost benefit, to understand cost benefit of opening the data and understanding if that use of data will be beneficial to whom, how it will be used. So there's a lot of discussion about, well, if you decide to open um, data from transportation, for instance, pick up and drop off locations for taxi, uh, who should be, as a municipal level, as a state, uh, who would you benefit by the open? Can you identify possible uh, organizations or agents that could be beneficial to use that data? What is the overall benefit that you're trying to reach? If you, ha if you have clear uh, concepts and ideas about that, you can understand like that the impact is truly beneficial or not, and you can somehow use a mathematical formulas to try to get some points on that. That's how they do this cost-benefit analysis. And at the same time, understanding the risks, like uh, if you're doing this, if you're opening this kind of data, is there reasons to believe, for examples, of <clears throat> techniques of de-anonymization that have been used that you know that you are in risk because you're using the same technique, so that data might be abused. You have examples of abuse that happens in uh, similar sectors that might point to you a reasonable risk of the abuse of those data, those data. and what's more, more, uh, more important, does that abusive use of data, does it um, uh, reach specific groups like minorities or people in socially disadvantaged positions? Because that should matter a lot. If you're opening the data that is only uh, reaching or is related to a specific group, like poor black people in Sao Paulo, uh, you should double the consideration and the concerns about opening that data. And I think there are some open questions for us to, to, to think. When we think about examples of open banking, there are a lot of questions, as Pacheco said, like what is the minimum information security standard that you are requiring to open the data? This was a big challenge in the Bradesco versus Guia Bolso case, that Guia Bolso was trying to 
uh, access personal information from information from the disco bank and there was a legal case on this and one of the main issues was precisely like the information security standards that the one the new controller uh, were supposed to have in order to access those data those data in order to not put the data subjects in a disadvantaged position there are a lot of discussions about access fees or licensing schemes for like controlled uh, open data or data pools. A lot of concerns as well from, from NGOs on how these access fees should work. Uh, because if you have an access that fee that is too high or too much uh, requirements, actually you cannot promote innovation. Like you, you cannot open up for new startups and so on. You only benefit those that have conditions and economic structure to reach those criteria. Uh, the, 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 the measures to avoid misuse, misuse of purpose, like can we design somehow parameters of like abusive deviation of purpose or with clear examples? Uh, this is not well developed at all. And there's also the, the question about data subjects, data portability, sorry, like uh, what do you mean about data portability? Do you mean only like registration data or data from device, or do you also mean inferred data? This is a very hard question. A lot of discussions as well in Brazil about that. But I think that to, to, to end my speak, my, 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 my talk, all those, uh, the design of those methodologies to reach the balance between open data and personal data should be participatory. Like we are in the process of experimentation and learning by doing and new examples and new rulings like the, the one from Supreme Court that we should be cautious. But this is also an opportunity to bridge the digital rights community and open data community and to make sure that the discussion about these methodologies are participatory. So this is also a great opportunity for engagement and, and collaboration. That's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, I think you uh, gave us a lot to think about, especially one uh, good point that uh, from several uh, arguments that you presented in your, during your presentation, uh, it was uh, the possibility to arrange organizations, for example, as data ops to negotiate data and to think that data could have uh, another role in some uh, organizations. I think. It would be interesting to investigate more about that, to gather examples regarding that, to think how can we organize, because when you mentioned uh, the Brazilian approach and you, you uh, uh, highlighted a big community of activists in Brazil, one good question would be, uh, could they uh, create uh, data co-ops and think about how to engage people to be more uh, aware uh, about uh, personal data uh, and data protection. Uh, this is one of the questions that when you were uh, presenting uh, your presentation, it came to, to, to my mind. And uh, I think we will have some time to explore this uh, by the end of this uh, event. But thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, moving forward, I would like to uh, hear from Kelsey Finch uh, I will introduce you, uh, Kelsey. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronounced correctly your name, but Kelsey Finch uh, is a senior counsel at the Future Privacy Forum. She leads uh, FPF's uh, Smart Privacy for Smart City, uh, Cities project and the uh, FPF uh, Smart Cities and Communities Working Group. She has uh, recently worked with the city of uh, Seattle to develop an open data risk assessment to support the city's public release of uh, civic data in privacy preserving ways. Thank you very much to uh, accept our uh, invitation, Kelsey. And uh, thank you very much to be a part of this event. The floor is yours. Please, you can start your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I am delighted to be part of this conversation today. Let me. Fingers crossed the technology is gonna be my friend. Can you guys all see my slides? Okay, great. <laughs> it's always the hardest part. Um, well, so thank you so much and thank you for that great introduction. Um, uh, exactly, I'm really delighted to pick up the thread from Raphael who um, was starting to think through what some of those processes for risk assessments, thinking through 
um, the participatory nature and some of the privacy risks. And this is exactly um, an exercise that I've been through with the city of Seattle uh, and thinking through um, sort of the operational um, aspects of this. So taking it um, from a good idea and trying to work it into practice. And so happy to share a little bit more about that process today. Um, all right, but so first, really quickly for folks who aren't familiar, the Future of Privacy Forum, uh, we're an independent privacy nonprofit based in the US, uh, but working globally. And our mission is to advance responsible data practices for emerging technologies. Uh, as you heard, I lead our work on smart and connected communities. Uh, I also lead our work on data de-identification and support efforts for ethical data sharing between um, companies, academics, governments, uh, and others. So thinking about these big picture questions that Raphael um, so helpfully teed up. So to give you a little bit of grounding and to share about how we got into this space, um, it started with a hands-on project in the city of Seattle, but I'll confess that we kicked off this work um, a couple of years ago. And at the time we'd had, we're, we're sort of a very privacy focused organization. We don't do other tech policy issues. And we'd heard so much about open data. There'd been so much momentum behind um, and this desire to open up data at the local um, state and federal level um, in the US and certainly around the world. And we sort of figured that it, we've been hearing about open data for a decade that surely somebody has figured out the privacy um, challenges here. And it turns out that wasn't necessarily the case that sort of trying to bridge these, um, you know, sort of dual missions of uh, shedding light on government activity um, without unduly revealing or exposing the activities of individuals um, it is a really tough challenge. And it is something um, that was requiring a lot of thoughtful work. So we found ourselves um, uh, actually tackling this challenge at the same time as a number of other organizations. So that Harvard Berkman team and the Raphael was just speaking about, um, and, and actually our two tools are fairly similar because we both built off of the NIST frameworks. Uh, and I think that that's a good sign that we're starting to come to some interoperable uh, approaches. Um, City of San Francisco was also building their own in-house approach and framework. And so there was this really bubbling up desire um, for tools and ways to start to actually apply these. We'd had enough uh, or we, we sort of talked about these issues for a long time and we needed to start putting, um, you know, some things down in practice. Um, so you know, just a little bit more background, right? The transparency goals of the open data movement serve really important social, economic and democratic functions um, at, everywhere in the world, particularly in cities like Seattle. Um, and, you know, at the same time, some municipal data sets about cities and their activities do carry inherent risks to individual privacy when they're shared publicly. Um, so in 2016, the city of Seattle declared that all of its civic, all of its public data or all the city data would be open by preference. Um, so except when doing so might impact individual privacy uh, or security. Uh, and so to ensure that its open data program was gonna effectively protect individuals, Seattle committed to performing an annual risk assessment uh, and they reached out to us to help develop the initial methodology for that and to do sort of the, the first um, scoping of, of what they were looking at. I think another piece of helpful background is that the city of Seattle comes from a very strong, uh, has both a very strong tech and innovation um, focus and ethos in the community. Uh, so this is the home of places like uh, Microsoft and Amazon, num numerous startups, um, but there's also a really strong and vocal community of privacy and civil liberties uh, that is deeply embedded in the framework of the city. And so this was a place that really desires to do both. Um, city of Seattle also has, um, it had, it was one of the first um, global cities to tackle privacy um, at a really um, big organizational level and is today one of the you know leading global um, you know municipalities tackling these issues uh, you know they're they're really um, at the front of the curve on this um, but when we walked in the open data and these privacy programs were separate I think they've since um, merged together but um, they, it was sort of a very dispersed each individual agency was doing it, making its own publication decisions they had this um, administrative um, you know desire to make all data open by preference there's a lot of um, you know goals to achieve it but it was a sort of disparate system and trying to figure out how do you operationalize that how do you have more consistent decision making how do you have um, you know, standards-based tools to make sure that you're doing this in a way that empowers the people working within cities to open up data. There's often a lot of fear um, about privacy. There's fear that you're going to negatively impact people in ways that you don't understand. And that can hold people back um, even when there are um, significant benefits to releasing the data. So hoping to build tools, hoping to give um, frameworks to, to overcome and, and build some courage and some, um, some confidence in these places. I also want to flag that the background of a lot of our thinking on this is the Washington State, which is home to the city of Seattle, is a very strong public records act that has a thumb 
in favor of transparency. So even where there will be privacy risk, oftentimes data must be compelled um, or must be shared with individuals who request it. So this is another place where the city was being really careful um, and is sort of thinking through um, what the regulatory, um, you know, pressures are and, and policy decisions that have been made at the state level um, compared to maybe more local flavor and preferences uh, around privacy um, versus openness. So our approach was to come in was to think about, um, you know, privacy safeguards, not just in law, but also in code and technology and social norms and public engagement. And how do you um, really figure out what the community's um, particular feelings are? Because you can find really, and I think particularly at the municipal level and particularly around open data, you can get really different perspectives on what is an appropriate use of data and what's not. We wanted to find ways to encourage and empower um, those sorts of differentiation on the ground. Um, we also wanted to think through maturity modeling and provide recommendations for growth because we realized that this is something that's very new for cities. We don't expect them to get it 100% um, correct and be extraordinarily mature right out of the gate. Um, but rather that there's going to be, you know, everybody's strapped for resources. Everybody's got different priorities and sort of trying to think through how do you slowly grow and how do you build a program um, over time. Um, so you know, our, basically our, our background and our methodology was to do a bunch of conversations with experts, um, both within the city and around the world, um, do a lot of literature review. We did a fair amount of public engagement, um, including with the in-person um, Seattle Technology Advisory Board, um, which is on the ground in Seattle, which I thought was a really great experience. Um, as I said, we built our framework on NIST privacy print security risk assessments, which is um, a framework that was very familiar in the US. Uh, and I think is just a, a nice, um, Nice to have interoperability and to have a framework that folks are familiar with already rather than building something entirely new and having to go through that learning curve. Um, and then just our core assumption, and I think it's really important, is that privacy risk in open data context is going to be a non-zero um, situation. There, there are going to be circumstances where the benefits of releasing data outweigh the risks to individuals. And that just given the nature of open data, it's not always going to be possible to achieve zero risk and that we need to have mechanisms that acknowledge that and make it okay for governments to to navigate those um, decisions with their communities so that's some it's a lot of background apologies for that but to dig in a little bit more when we were thinking through it we were thinking through um, a couple of specific buckets of privacy risk that stood out to us um, as things that we really wanted to address and we really wanted cities to be paying attention to and to build programs around and um, and it is a little bit of this tight walk or tightrope walking um, so we looked at re-identification, um, whether direct or indirect, as I think probably the most obvious um, and significant privacy risk in a lot of these spaces. Um, and we had a number of examples uh, at the time in the US of um, governments inadvertently exposing personal information um, through data sets that they've made available publicly. Um, and, and I can get into examples um, later, but just suffice to say that sometimes it was through um, you know, lack of screening and attention uh, where significant um, personal and sensitive data was just published by accident. You know, if you're publishing um, a, a data set that has, you know, tens of thousands of rows, it's really easy to miss a couple in there um, that might have directly identifying information. Um, in other cases, it was situations where cities had tried to do some obfuscation, they had done some redaction, and they had done some work to take identities uh, information out of their data sets, but that when you compared one data set to another, um, and even um, across different levels of government, that maybe a city was releasing data in a slightly different way than a state or a federal agency, you were still able to pair those together and start to identify individuals and reveal sensitive information about them. Or sometimes it was simply that they were releasing data that's not in a format that is really easy to de-identify and to protect. Um, free text field, it turns out, is often the culprit here. Uh, and so you just ended up with, again, not being able to um, effectively take all the personal information out. And then it, it becomes available. And once it's out in the world, you can never really pull it back. And the privacy risk is just going to be permanent. Um, so some of the contributing factors that we were thinking around that were raising the risk of re-identification um, are sort of constant advances in re-identification science and capabilities. The computing power that is necessary to do this um, it is dropping quickly. It's becoming much cheaper and, and faster to do. Um, 
the growth of data marketplaces where you can buy um, data records for pennies on the dollar that you might be able to then compare against open data records and start to identify individuals. Uh, and then again, outdated public records laws, um, like the one in the state of Washington, uh, where even if the government, uh, even if the city government was doing a lot of work to de-identify its data as a technical matter, um, it was still the case that an individual could simply submit a public records request and receive the raw data from the city in a different mechanism, um, defeating the purpose of all of the robust um, de-identification they might have done for the open data set. Uh, we were also really concerned about um, sort of downstream impacts around data quality and um, potential inequities. Um, so recognizing that oftentimes, um, you know, the things that are captured in open data portals are meant to be used, whether that's by individuals or community groups, NGOs, academic researchers, other government agencies, or even commercial entities. Um, and that if the information in the open data is wrong, um, it can have really consequential impacts um, for individuals. So we had examples of people who were um, incorrectly represented in a database of, you know, both people who've been arrested for driving under the influence or who'd been arrested for other purposes. And that kind of incorrect information might cost somebody a job. It might keep them from getting opportunity, um, you know, educational opportunities um, or to rent an apartment or, you know, any number of other things that um, it's really critical that that information be accurate. Um, we also worry about, um, you know, even if it's not pinging an individual um, incorrectly, that if the data isn't representative, it might lead to uh, inequitable distribution of public services um, or other commercial services. So, um, you know, if you are um, using open data to determine um, where to fix potholes or where to send 911 services or, or emergency services um, first, you need to make sure that that data is really accurately representing everybody and that it captures and bridges digital divides and doesn't just reinforce them and lead to further marginalization of vulnerable populations. So that's the thing that we were really concerned about as well. And, and the sort of contributing factors that we were worried about there are um, whether cities are collecting or otherwise acquiring or even appending um, data that is inaccurate or outdated or incomplete or unrepresentative in some way. <laughs> the tension here is that, of course, if you're trying to protect um, data from re-identification, you might be perturbing the data. You might be introducing intentional inaccuracy um, to protect individual identities, but then it becomes really important to think about um, whether, like, how you're messaging and um, providing caveats around the reliability of the data to um, stem off some of these quality concerns. Uh, and then finally, the, the sort of the overarching issue for all of these things is that um, if people don't trust that the government, um, you know, that the data they're providing to the government is going to be used appropriately and kept confidential when it should be, um, then, you know, either real or perceived um, concerns about the government making their data more available, um, you know, will provide, will, will lead to individuals um, engaging in self-help, right? So people um, might provide false information um, on government forms or surveys, uh, or you know, attempt to fool sensors, uh, sensor networks or other kinds of smart city activities. Um, they might just cease using public services entirely. We've seen this in a couple of situations in the US where um, you know, people might, uh, parents would stop seeking mental health services um, because they were worried that that information would flow into the um, child welfare databases and their children would be taken away. Um, so those sorts of, of impacts are, are really important. And even um, I think some of the things that we need to be careful about here, some of these contributing factors is the frequency with which data does get breached from government. It, it does happen. It's, it's not an impossibility. Um, or other situations where data is unintentionally exposed. Um, there's often a history of miscommunication and mistrust that needs to be overcome um, within the communities uh, with their governments. And then finally, we have some unsettled norms and expectations about privacy and public data. There's not good communication about when you're providing information, whether it will likely be um, provided to an open data program, whether it will be available through public records requests or to other government agencies or law enforcement, for example. And so all of these things combine to, um, you know, sort of undermine um, people's willingness to value and support and really benefit um, from these open data programs. So those are all some of the privacy risks. I've spoken for a long time about those, <laughs> apologies. But a little bit about our tool, um, we wanted to focus both on helping the city uh, evaluate privacy risks in open data sets prior to release, so specific data sets, um, 
And then we wanted to evaluate privacy risks in the open data program holistically. So both individual data and then um, how the program as a whole is looking at it. So analyzing the individual data sets is a pretty straightforward process. This is like any other kind of privacy risk assessment. Um, but particularly we asked city um, folks to describe the data to evaluate the benefits, evaluate the risks, weigh those benefits against the risks, apply mitigations and safeguards, and then evaluate, reevaluate, and document any countervailing factors. And I'll go into a little bit more depth on these. Um, so when I say evaluate the data, we were asking cities to think about identifiability, to think about sensitivity, um, and also to flag if they were holding things that aren't easily de-identified. Um, so unstructured data, location data, free text fields, that those are really difficult with our current technology to make available to the public with no other restrictions. So maybe this isn't the appropriate time. Maybe we need to wait for more resources and capabilities um, to come to the municipal level to really make this effective. Uh, we also wanted to give some prompts around linkability and thinking about the accessibility of other data that's out there, whether it can be purchased from consumers, whether it's known by um, uh, other levels of government that might lead to this inadvertent um, re-identification of individuals. And then we wanted to think about context as well, because it might be that the data is effectively um, you know, doesn't reveal sensitive information about individuals, but if it was collected from a police body cam or from a drone system or some other surveillance network, that can trigger uh, different kinds of privacy concerns and potential backlash. And it's probably not a great place to start for open data. You might need to have more community engagement. You might need to do um, more detailed conversations with the community about whether that kind of information is what they want to be, if that's a priority for them to have in the open data programs. So thinking through some of those contextual factors as well. Um, then, as, you know, similar to as you were hearing before, we were thinking about the benefits of release. So who are the likely users? What are the foreseeable benefits? And then how likely are those to occur and how significant are they? Uh, and privacy often um, struggles from this problem of things that are uh, benefits and the risks are likely um, or are often um, low likelihood, but very high impact. And that's a hard thing to navigate operationally, but it's good to surface it and to have it in mind. So uh, evaluating the benefits, similarly thinking about the risks of release, who are the unintended users, what are the foreseeable harms? Um, and then again, how likely are they to, for those risks to occur and how significant would they be um, you know, on a scale from negligible to severe to catastrophic? Um, and then you pull all of that together and then you get a risk score um, and, and sort of some suggested release outcomes. Um, and so for us, we, you know, some of the categories that we were thinking through were, you know, if the risks um, are quite low and the benefits substantially outweigh them, you know what, you're in a good spot. The data is ready to be released most likely. Um, if the risks and the benefits are a little bit closer, uh, perhaps you need to think about how to limit access to it, where there's a little bit more sensitivity and you want to have some more control uh, over, for example, what downstream uses are appropriate. Um, maybe you need additional screening. Maybe this is something where you need a disclosure review board or an ethical review board um, that includes community participation uh, or other expertise to navigate um, where the line is a little bit closer. Um, or perhaps it's not ready to be published because the privacy risks are so significant. Um, and at that stage, if it's possible, go back and apply some technical or administrative controls, right? Think about um, some of those, you know, using experts, um, using um, de-identification techniques, um, doing different kinds of transparency and accountability uh, mechanisms. And then if you need to repeat those, those first steps until you are, feel like the data set is in an appropriate spot. Um, we did, however, want to leave um, a bucket at the end, which is to say that in, there are certainly going to be some data sets where there is a high privacy risk that is still worth releasing um, through open data programs in light of important public policy um, considerations. And this is going to be a very subjective, unique to each city um, determination. Um, but our example, and something the city of Seattle was struggling with at the time, was that they wanted to publish the salaries of elected officials to shine a light on, um, you know, how much uh, folks were making to shine a light on um, the effective use of, of city dollars and whether the public felt that those amounts were appropriate. Um, but this was really high risk because it was pretty easy to identify, uh, you know, who was in those positions, who had those titles and how much their salary was. Um, and, and so that would have come up in a do not publish on our, on our recommendation, uh, but there was a compelling public interest. This was something that the public decided um, was worth doing even though there was some residual risk to individuals. Uh, and so 
our, our recommendations in this kind of situation is to, um, you know, err on the side of caution that it's always possible to release data again in the, uh, in the future um, when your safeguards and your controls maybe are more available. Um, but once it's been made public, you can't ever pull it back. The risk is just out there. Um, and then the second is that anytime that cities are going to deviate from these sorts of analyses or make these determinations that there is some other kind of um, policy rationale for releasing data, um, just to clearly document that reasoning. So there's some transparency and there's some accountability, um, both to the public and internally, so that um, cities can learn and build a body of knowledge. Um, that was the, the big piece uh, is sort of evaluating each individual data set. Um, we also looked at program maturity, as I said, and we looked at six buckets. Uh, and we sort of used this maturity framework from you know an ad hoc approach um, all the way up to something that is well funded, very routine, has like clear roles and responsibilities, and can run on its own. Um, and we looked at privacy leadership and management. Um, so how much training was being done? Um, how much accountability was there? How clear and uh, transparent were the processes? And then particularly um, how to connect collection decisions and release decisions. Because I think oftentimes the people who are deciding in open data context what to release didn't have much to say about what was collected, even though that's an equally important part. So trying to connect the decision-making life cycle um, more closely within the city. Uh, we also asked about, you know, or thought about whether folks are using these sorts of benefit risk assessments. Um, and, and whether there are um, opportunities to trigger reassessment as time passes. Um, thinking about the availability of deification tools and strategies, um, because in the open data context, um, if you don't have an ability to limit access to data, deidentification tools really are one of the most powerful um, uh, tech, like safeguards that you'll have. Um, but as we were, you know, heard earlier, they are of course not a silver bullet and you need to be very careful about how you apply them. Um, we also thought about data quality review, um, data equity and fairness, and then transparency and public engagement as key program components that sort of taking this holistic picture um, to make sure the city was able to navigate um, making these sorts of decisions and building um, some of that muscle memory, building that body of knowledge internally. Um, and we wanted to recognize that uh, there is a lot out there on public engagement. There's a lot out there on de-identification. Um, if the tools might be hard to reach, but there's a lot of knowledge. Um, but things like, um, you know, disparate impact analysis for open data are very new. Um, consulting sort of experiential experts about um, the downstream impacts is something that not many cities have done. There aren't a lot of tools. Um, and so it, we wanted to make sure that partly why we were using this maturity model was that, um, you know, if a city was very strong in one piece and still learning in another, that, that was, um, you know, part of a big picture. And we wanted to give them credit for both and then provide recommendations um, for becoming more mature uh, in spaces where they hadn't um, yet had time or an opportunity to focus. So that's sort of the big picture of how we were approaching this. Um, I'm just going to wrap up quickly with a couple of lessons learned, um, both on the tool side and on the culture side. Um, and the first of these is that consistency um, in evaluating risks and benefits is really important, particularly because a lot of cities are built um, in a distributed or a um, decentralized method where you're going to be having each agency making different kinds of decisions. And you want to make sure that there, um, <laughs> there's some consistency. Um, so City of Seattle, for example, and I ding them for this all the time, <laughs> is that they, they released 911 data sets from both the police department and the fire department. And the police would um, take these emergency services calls and they would um, aggregate or they would scrub the address to the to the block level. So you wouldn't get a particular house, but you'd get the sort of the neighborhood in which it was occurring. Uh, and the fire department would release the exact same information, but they would have a precise address on it. So like you wanna make sure that you're not having that kind of inconsistency. Uh, and a lot of that is about, um, you know, building organizational structure and, and having um, you know, support in place. We also want to encourage cities to partner with universities and others. So if there are these sort of advanced identification tools that they can't build in house, um, but that there's a, often, um, you know, global experts right next door and that sort of the building these partnerships and, and um, reaching out to other folks and geos or companies or others might have um, more available resources, I think is a really important piece. And then finally, just to make sure that there's an escape hatch, there's a way to have non-standard answers to publish data um, or not publish data, um, respect, irrespective of what the charts are saying, um, given local needs and sensitivities. Um, and then finally, just sort of the cultural pieces, right? 
as I was speaking earlier about organizational structure and support is key so you avoid bottlenecks and so you can actually make this process work. Um, if privacy becomes a barrier to everything, people are going to lose trust in it. It's not going to be, um, as Raphael was saying, sort of working complementary uh, with all of the other goals that they're trying to achieve. Um, needing to collect decisions about collection and disclosure is a part of that. Um, and then recognizing that it's not just a technical question. Open data can often skew to sort of data science um, and folks like that. But you need you need lawyers, you need engineers, you need the public voice, and you particularly need to broaden the context. And I think um, you know again, um, just echoing all of the great work and, and discussion from Raphael is thinking about trust, thinking about equity, you know, about communication and social ties, and bringing all of this together to serve the the goals and the mission of the open data program. Um, it more effectively in a sustainable manner um, that can last into the future. So, all right, that's, I think I went over time, apologies, but thank you for having me and happy to continue the discussion in a bit. Thank you very much, Kelsey. Uh, it was very, very, very good. Uh, I'll have several questions to, to ask you, but I selected just one for the last part of our event. But one, one thing that you, you say uh, at the end of your um, presentation, it was that we need people coming from different perspectives to actually uh, try to implement uh, a project with this um, complexity. Uh, we need lawyers, we need people from uh, computer science, we, we, we need people from different perspectives, different uh, uh, backgrounds to uh, do a test that, uh, uh, in some broad sense, need to think what would be the purpose of the data, how can we store the data, how can we use and share the data, so on and so forth. So it was very interesting to see uh, uh, how uh, the uh, uh, model that you presented, it's not only complex, but uh, tackles a lot of problems that we have uh, nowadays should think about open data in uh, not only big cities, but in, in cities uh, in general. Thank you very much for your presentation. We have questions uh, uh, in the end of our event to you. And moving forward, uh, I would like to introduce uh, to our audience, uh, Anna Artyushina. I don't know if I pronounced correctly, I made a guess regarding the <laughs> <laughs> your, your last name, but I, I tried my best here. Uh, Anna is a public policy scholar uh, specializing in data governance and smart cities. In uh, 2020 uh, in 2021, Anna serves as a science advisor in a range of government and nonprofit organizations in Canada, including the Information and Communications Technology Council of Canada. Thank you very much to be a part of this event. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, let me, this is my, okay. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, okay. Do, do, do you see anything? Sorry. No? Oh, you're okay. not seeing anything here yet. Uh, and now? Um, no, not yet. Sorry about that. So, no sure. Hmm? Let me see. Uh, can you can you help me? Go. Yeah, maybe I'm not a co-host. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, uh, do you have uh, your presentation uh, on the back of uh, the screen? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, you click on sharing your screen and selected the your presentation. I did. Um, okay, share and okay. It says open. Um, okay. Okay. I, I don't know what's happening. I'm sorry. Um, hmm. Okay, I have any, uh,
sorry guys i will turn off my camera for a second and, and share my screen okay just for a second sorry about that no problem um, josh And I will try to share her screen with us, but not to stop our event. I'd like to uh, ask a question for Rafael, if I may. Uh, Rafael, uh, one question that I have for you, and when Anna, uh, uh, when Anna uh, will be uh, ready for us, she will uh, start her presentation. Rafael, uh, one interest argument that you presented in your paper, uh, open personal data pillars to new digital markets, is that a society, uh, it, it does, as a society, we need to stimulate data governance models that are able to guarantee an open flow of data among different private actors. Oh, so we have, let me skip. You hold the question. Uh, my, <laughs> I will hold my question and <laughs> let Anna start her presentation. We are seeing your presentation, Anna. Uh, are you ready to start? We are not hearing from Anna. So, yeah. Oh, perfect. Can you, wonderful. Um, so, yeah. I'm sorry about this. I don't know, it's first time happening to me. So um, thank you, Raphael, Alexander, and Kelsey for, for this insightful discussion. It's been a delight and I'm happy to be here. Um, um, so I will pick up on some of the themes you touched upon, specifically the, um, the community benefits of open data and the privacy challenges that come along with it. Uh, I probably should. Um, so, but let me uh, let me begin uh, with a with the anecdote. So, in October, I was part of our uh, data commons workshop where uh, Chief Privacy Officer of Seattle, um, Ginger Ambuster, was speaking about her experience working with uh, municipal data. Um, Historically, American cities collect enormous amount of data. In one way to protect citizen privacy was to uh, to restrict the movement of data between the different departments. So the Department of Transportation would not share the data with the police. Uh, unfortunately, as Ms. Ambuster uh, explained to us, uh, this, this has never been as easy as it sounds. So uh, going back to, to Kelsey's presentation, there have been security breaches, there have been cases where sensitive data uh, has been exposed accidentally, and it usually happens, it often happens. Um, and and uh, interestingly, open data only complicates, further complicates the matters, as uh, with the digitization of services, municipal workers find themselves overwhelmed, sometimes not with the personal, but with the personalized data. And uh, in Seattle, what she has found is that municipal workers didn't have uh, the proper protocols to store the data, to share the data, and even to protect the data. So um, today we'll be speaking about data trust as a viable alternative uh, to open data. Uh, probably a little bit more, a little bit costly alternative, but uh, worth considering. So, um, so what? I, I don't want to delve uh, into the difference between open data and data trust approach, but I would like to highlight a few problems that um, scholars and privacy experts have identified with open data, which as uh, which data governance, uh, sorry, data trust framework uh, strives to solve. So one of them is the data collected in cities often, if not always, engages uh, public, private, and commercial interests. And finding the right balance between those is always tricky. Second, as Kelsey had mentioned, uh, quite often releasing certain types of data, especially uh, dealing with marginalized communities, racialized communities, it has been linked to the cases of marginalization and uh, racial discrimination. 
And third, and this is an interesting thing, uh, over the years, civic entrepreneurship around open data in North America has been steadily declining. Recently, in recent years, the community uptake has been so, so low that some open data activists and open data practitioners in, in America declare the open data movement to be dead. So why do we need data trusts and how, how data trusts are different? So the, the data trust framework um, is, has been discussed over the last three years um, as a way to reconcile the commercial, the, the interests of privacy with the, with the commercial interests and public interests. It comes to replace the consent-based approaches to uh, data governance. And um, originally the data trust framework is premised on two main principles. The first one is uh, we need to physically, we need to separate, decouple the data from platform companies, physically separate those. And second, we expect the data controller to be, uh, to have fiduciary obligations towards data subjects. Um, interestingly, beyond these two foundational principles, data trust vary significantly. There are full private models, there are data cooperatives, uh, there are public data trusts, and um, uh, the Open Data Institute, which was created by Tim Berners-Lee to explore the potential of data trust framework, uh, uh, defines open uh, data trust as a legal structure, uh, defined um, data trust as a legal structure that, that um, um, that provides independent stewardship of data. You can see this is a pretty weak definition and there is a reason for that. Um, so I will be using specific examples to, to explain how data trusts work, how different they are, how versatile they are, and what are the pros and cons of different models for, for the data trusts. So before I delve into this discussion, I would like to say that uh, uh, most of the, like all the existing data trust, except for Truata, and I will I will be speaking about Truata specifically, exist in uh, in the experimental phase. So, so basically, we can only look uh, to Truata to give us some guidance as to how data trust work. So, um, another interesting thing I would like to highlight at this stage. Um, sorry, I, I skipped this slide, and it might be interested uh, interesting to you. Um, there is a uh, NASA literature to, to read about data trust, and I'm more than happy to share uh, all this uh, text and reports with anyone interested. So, um, so another interesting thing uh, about data trust, uh, when data trust has been originally conceived of, they were they were thought of um, in in a very simple way. They were thought of uh, as coping common trusts, as someone who manages your assets for you. But uh, several cases of failed data trust show us that that's not quite how things work. And um, so if you, uh, if you are planning to attend uh, the upcoming uh, Open Data Institute event, or if you go to their website, you'll see that right now they're speaking about data institutions. And this is a very characteristic change because what, what has transpired is that we cannot just create some kind of trusts to manage our data on our behalf without creating a whole new infrastructure around them. And this is a legal infrastructure, like there are different layers to this infrastructure. This, uh, this, uh, this is a legal infrastructure, social infrastructure, economic infrastructure. And this is also a new type of digital architecture and physical infrastructure, servers. So um, let us move to, to better understand um, what, data trust, what data trusts are. Um, I, I will use this model. This is a model for uh, for, for profit data trust. And as you can see here, it introduces several new uh, definitions. So one concept is a data producer. This is the person whose data is being collected. Now we have another way, uh, one is data consumer. Those are companies who will use your data uh, for marketing purposes or for trading data. And there is a trustee, the data trust, who will manage and govern, in some cases, the data for, for the data producer. 
and there is also policies. So, so, so let me stop on this. Um, so policies is something that's very important in this case. Uh, so this is one thing that data trusts take from common law. This is how trusts and data trusts, uh, uh, that's what they share. Um, uh, data trusts are governed by a charter. This means you can design data trust to serve any purpose. It can have any organizational structure. It can have all sorts of business models. And this versatility is quite unique. And uh, while it's obviously an advantage, there may be some privacy risks coming with it. Um, I will be speaking about that when we will be discussing Sidewalk Club's data trust. But um, let us take a look um, at this model. So as you can see, uh, there are lots of pros to this. Um, so an obvious advantage is that for a data producer, it gives some kind of some measure of control over the data. It's a one-stop shop to, to track your data, to see where it travels, and to be financially reimbursed for the data. But there are some serious disadvantages to this model. So one of them, uh, the payments will, will likely to be paltry. Uh, for the data trust to take off the ground, it needs to amass huge amounts of data. So to make this, uh, to make this model uh, sustainable financially is quite tricky. And also as a for-profit enterprise, it might end up selling your data to the highest bidder. Uh, now let us move on to the, uh, to the success story. This is Truata by, by MasterCard, and this is so far the only working <laughs> data trust. So Truata was created in 2018 by MasterCard and IBM when uh, MasterCard realized that their governance practices were not in compliance with the GDPR. And the schematic is pretty straightforward, but uh, let me explain. So MasterCard and IBM act as the founders of the trust. And MasterCard is also the biggest client of the trust. Uh, Truata acts as an independent trustee. This means that there is no conflict of interest. MasterCard cannot define its policies. It cannot somehow or anyhow influence uh, the way data is being managed or sold. So what they do, they um, basically they keep all the data collected by the MasterCard in Europe. Uh, they anonymize it and they uh, provide it uh, to, to the clients, to the companies who, who are willing to use it for marketing purposes or trading data um, uh, in exchange for payment. Uh, and one interesting thing, the data does not travel. It's kept on Trotta servers and the clients only have access to it through uh, IPIs. So um, what are the benefits of this, uh, of this model? There are plenty. So uh, MasterCard reports that uh, uh, Truata generates 30 US million dollars uh, per annum. Uh, there, there have not been any security breaches or privacy conflicts, nothing. Truata uh, positions itself as a uh, data controller. The difference between data controller and uh, data processor is that processor manages your data and it doesn't set up policies. And data controller, uh, as Raphael mentioned, is is um, is very important position because it allows uh, it allows the trust or uh, the community to act um, as a provider for someone else. So uh, Truata can be looked at um, as a as a successful store as a successful example of the data trust. But this is just one. And what are the cons? Well. As you can see, there is no mention of citizens or any public interest. This is a B2B enterprise. It's profitable, but so far it's not quite clear whether, or if or whether it, it will have any public benefits. Um, so there is an interesting uh, uh, type of uh, data trust, data cooperatives. And uh, here I would like to go back to Raphael's um, Raphael's uh, presentation because I think it's very important to uh, to to uh, to understand the difference between the two. Um, so, data cooperatives uh, 
they are not about pu uh, putting the data in public domain, in the public domain. Data cooperative is about sharing the data among the users, among the data subjects. So one example is when in California, Uber drivers started to pull the data and use it to, uh, to come at Uber, to understand how the pricing works, how they really works and why the prices go up at certain times. Um, so, so, so what do we know about data trust? So far, there are no functioning data trusts. There are several concepts. Uh, and uh, I've talked to people who have been developing uh, data cooperatives in Netherlands. This is a NASA age, uh, haven't started yet. There is a data trust, a data cooperative in Switzerland uh, in the experimental stage, pilot. And um, another pilot is, is being started in Los Angeles. So we will see how it works, but so far from what I've learned from, from, from the developers, from the, uh, from the founders of this project is that uh, this model is absolutely perfect for people who do not want to share their data. Because uh, it allows, so basically you store your data yourself and it, it is a tool for collective management of this, uh, of this specific data set or uh, several data sets. Um, it has limited economic potential because, like I said, uh, data, pay data payments will be paltry unless you, uh, you prepare or augment the data set for a large scale buyer. And uh, so one problem they, uh, they've been facing, all of them, uh, is that it's very hard to, um, to support this type of uh, cooperative financially. So the servers, the paid work, uh, the development of, uh, of APIs, all that requires funding. And quite often data cooperatives, unless they are supported by, by a municipality, they don't have those resources. Uh, but this is, I would say, this is definitely a very interesting model. Um, so public data trusts, uh, so there are there are, I would say, a thousand concepts for the public data trust. They're very different. Um, and basically the idea is that, that we create uh, a trust which stores and employs the data uh, for a public cause. A cause can be anything. Um, so probably the, the most <laughs> famous or infamous uh, case of the public data trust is uh, Sidewalk, Sidewalk Labs Data Trust. I've written about it. And um, I don't want to uh, go into, into detail, but, but just to explain briefly. So uh, with the pub public data trust are tricky, uh, again, because of the financial responsibility, because of the large infrastructural changes they require. And with, uh, and with urban data trust, what we see is that uh, there have not been any legal framework to support the trust. So it was in a direct conflict with uh, Canada's data protection and privacy laws. And that put sidewalk labs in conflict with the municipal uh, administration and, and provincial government. Uh, another problem which, uh, which was pointed out by, uh, by Canadian privacy expert is that it wasn't quite clear who was the beneficiary of the trust. And while it's quite clear with the for-profit trust, with the public trust, it turns out to be a huge problem. Um, we, we, we always need to, to look uh, at the trust in the context uh, of their uh, implementation. So with, uh, with Sidewalk Labs Data Trust, it was part of the larger uh, company's governance model with Sidewalk Labs willing to sole source the project and to own the old intellectual property developed uh, in the project. So to, in a nutshell, uh, in this case, the data trust was a way to take control over the data. Uh, also, any data trust, like I said, uh, requires new or updated uh, legal framework. And so in the case of the uh, of sidewalk, of sidewalk Labs Data Trust, we've seen them trying to come up with new semi-legal definitions of data, which, which have been heavily criticized because they ended up uh, exempting the data from Canadian law. Um, so to, to end on a positive note, how do we make them work? 
So, uh, so the biggest problem with the data trust so far is that uh, it's very hard to establish ownership of data. So in a few jurisdictions allow for that. And even tracing, understanding who controls the data may be tricky. So, uh, so some kind of legal framework is needed. And most likely there will be a coordinated effort on, on, on parts of the governance to, uh, or, or, like most likely there will be an international at attempt to define what data trusts are and how they work. Um, so, like I said, we need to clearly define the beneficiary of the trust because this is the key. Uh, and if this is a public trust, uh, we need to understand that uh, multipurposing can be a problem. So it's good to have one or two public purposes so the data doesn't leak and data is not uh, traded uh, to the highest bidder. Um, it is very important that data trust acts as an independent steward. We've seen this with Truata, and this is very good practice. So no conflicts of interests. And uh, so far, the biggest problem is who funds the physical and digital infrastructure. So with the Truat, it was MasterCard with this endless pockets and with Sidewalk Labs, it was planned to be Canadian government. Uh, several data trusts that have been developed, um, like public data trusts, they heavily depend on the public funding. So this is something to pay attention to. So that's basically it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I, I have also uh, several ideas that I would like to share uh, with our guests and not only about your presentation because we receive a lot of questions from our audience and my uh, suggestion here is we have uh, rounds of two minute answers so I'll present a question I know that it would be a difficult ta uh, task to fulfill here to answer questions from our audience in two, maybe three minutes, but we have a lot of questions. So I think uh, this uh, would be a good way to try to, to give uh, a preliminary answer regarding uh, those questions. So let me start with the first question from the audience. The first question is, what is the role of civil society in the decisions of open data? How open uh, data can guarantee uh, data as a common good of society? So let us start with Rafael, after Rafael, Kelsey, and after Kelsey, Anna. Rafael. Well, I think Kelsey just nailed it in her presentation, uh, just exploring um, the, the key importance of getting together the civil society and not only one specific set of experts from the legal field or for, from public administration, for instance. And I think in Brazil, this has a lot of potentials for, for the new administrations that will come up and will begin next year in cities like Sao Paulo, in Curitiba, in Salvador and others. And considering that we do have, as I told you, you guys, a strong community of open data and um, civic activism online, and also a very strong community of digital rights that really was formed in the past five years. And one thing that I, I truly, truly believe it is necessary as well is the role of not only organized associations, so to speak, but also public interest technologists and people that are coming from the computer uh, science, universities, or courses wanting to help and wanting to design um, technical methodologies or techniques of anonymization and to test them and to serve these techniques for, for the public interest. So not only civil society in the sense of getting together NGOs and associations, but also this open call for any kind of participation from anyone that has interest in discussing this. And I think it's all about um, making sure that you have trust from the community and, and, and making sure that you can learn from different perspectives. And all the experiences that we had in the past of using this multi-stakeholder approach that it is common in Brazil for internet governance matters should be adopted when we're talking about 
open data in the municipal level and, and, and making sure that people can participate. We know that it is hard in, in times of COVID and in times of this crisis in which we are deeply concerned about health issues and about the future of our jobs and about the democratic instability in Brazil. But we should not forget of this uh, social goal of making sure that we do have participation in these methodologies. Yeah, I'll add to that. I mean, I think all of what Rafael was saying is uh, exactly right, that there, it, it, part of the way that you make these programs successful um, isn't just funding, isn't just like political will, but you really need the buy-in of the community and the people who can speak on behalf of folks who don't often have a voice in this process. And that if they're not engaged and they don't have a role and an opportunity to uh, have a voice in its development, that it's not gonna be sustainable. You might have a short-term success, but you won't have a program that really um, shows value. And that you know, fundamentally the, the goal of the Open Data Program is to empower uh, individuals and communities um, who you might not have expected to do things with the data. Um, it's, it's not just to serve any particular interest. It's one of the privacy challenges that you're hoping to open it up to any number of purposes. Um, but I think one of the ways that the community members can be particularly uh, engaged and useful is helping set priorities for what data sets um, should be released and, and which ones are going to be the most valuable to them and to actually tackling the local challenges and to helping government do its job better, um, rather than just having city administrators or outside lobbyists or other forces sort of think like, you know, doing that externally and then imposing it on the, the public. But you can really get a lot of um, good in like important substantive insights from the community and the people who are living these experiences and can tell you that's not actually what we need to be focusing on. It turns out our community is much more concerned about this, this, and this. And if you can provide us data and tools, we can resolve them and we can like, that will build trust, that will build solidarity. And so making sure that you're, um, you know, not just sort of thinking about passive ways to share, to, to tell people what's happening, but that you're actually giving them opportunities to have a real decision-making role and that you're doing that in a way that's meaningful and inclusive, I think is, is a really important piece of this. So. All of that is to say that like, without those things, you won't have a sustainable, valuable program in the long term. So uh, just so to add something like a critical note to what <laughs> has been said. Um, so uh, my, my, my upcoming uh, forthcoming paper deals with uh, public engagement with smart cities. And what I found looking at Sidewalk Toronto and also European smart cities is, is that it has been extremely hard to work with the public around these issues. And is, this is not to say that uh, it's, it's the fault of the municipalities or the companies. There are a range of factors in place here. So one of them, uh, you actually need to educate the public when it when we are not, if we're not speaking about the uh, technical community, the entrepreneurs, the uh, why the community tends to be very suspicious of everything new and smart cities and any type of digital technologies, uh, digital technology employed in the city. Another thing is that uh, there's been a lot of research on that is that companies themselves may not be willing to share project documentation because of their uh, patent claims or I don't know, trade secrets. and. So making this work is extremely difficult. Uh, there have been an interesting recent study by Rob Kitchen. Uh, he, they, they looked, um, he and his colleague looked uh, into the smart city initiatives across Europe for the last 10 years. None of them was truly engaging. There were no public engagement. There is some on paper, but it seems as if no one uh, has known how to do this. So we're gonna, we, we enter in an interesting stage. We're gonna learn to do this, but we have to. <laughs> so that's yeah i'll just i'll echo it i know that that's the thing that you know seattle and others have struggled with it is really difficult to get more than the same 10 people into a room and to yes. get the kinds yeah. of feedback that you need and that like i think one of the things to know for open data programs to be successful is that you need to put a lot of resources into that you need to yeah. find that you need to go to the communities you need to find ways and educate and like have any number of languages and accessibility and like, overcome lots of barriers. And that's a skill set that I think often isn't prioritized by the tech folks and the people who are in sort of the you know innovation or the technology frame of mind. Um, and that we need to do a lot of 
groundwork um, before you can even get to these points. Um, but I think that just needs more time and commitment. Yeah, I think yeah, it, it uh, has been changing. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> No, no, no problem. I, I just want to jump in, into the discussion to add a, another level of complexity because one of our questions uh, that uh, our audience uh, ask us, it is, uh, should the citizens participate in the decision of acceptable risks? For example, uh, we have a, a challenge that it is the translation of not only technical terms, but actually the risk of, for example, exposure of the data. People mm -hmm. usually have difficulty to understand what, what is the problem of re-identification. Re yeah. uh, people usually have problems regarding anonymization, so on and so forth. How can we educate or uh, try to engage people uh, regarding specific discussions? For example, one, um, one uh, uh, essential one, it is one fundamental, uh, it is the idea of risk. Uh, mm -hmm. What is risk for people uh, uh, in a broad sense here? So uh, I would like to start with Anna uh, because I was uh, amazed by uh, your idea that working with uh, people and engage them with the, uh, this discussion, it's very hard and I agree with you. I would like to hear from you regarding that after Kelsey and uh, Rafael. So I, I will have a very short comment so everyone else can uh, pick up on that. So, so uh, what we've seen in Canada, um, there have been a recent um, very unpleasant uh, scandal when uh, municipality shared public health uh, data. It was not anonymized and it was it clearly showed where the hot, COVID hotspots were. And they've been in the, in the poorest neighborhoods of Toronto. Uh, and while there have not been massive attacks, but there have been people, you know, attacking other people on social media and trying to put this as a problem of uh, us versus them. And what our privacy experts and, and uh, government uh, workers have been doing, they started a conversation with, with the people living in these neighborhoods to, to explain why they shared this data, why it was important, and how they're going to prevent this from happening again. Because this is a clear example of how open data can harm the community, how it, it can put it in direct danger. So, and I would say that the uptake was quite good. So if you, well, it seems like a hard conversation, complicated, it's not hard, it's complicated, technically, technically complicated. Uh, but when you start explaining how contact tracing work, how uh, different types of data has been collected. And, and actually, you know, I, you know this already, the public, quite often people do not know the, how much data has been collected about them. And this is the problem with open data. When something like this happens, when there is a scandal, there is a conflict, everyone is being amazed. Like, oh guys, you have my, my home address, how come? But so I would say, we need to start from the ground and it, it should start as an education campaign for the people. And it, it would probably be wise to start not from the educated people like technology entrepreneurs, technology experts, academics, but from people whose data is being collected and spe specifically focus on the marginalized communities because they, they're going to be affected the most as, it's, as the practice shows. So I don't know if it answers your question. I'm happy to share my, my paper. So we can talk more about it. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Kelsey? Yeah, I'll jump in and I'll say that I'm super interested in, in your paper as well. <laughs> so sign me up for that. Um, I think one of the things that's the most effective and I think one of the things that's also the hardest is communicating what are the benefits, like what are the purposes for which this data will be used or could be used? And if you can have that conversation, I think that's a really effective way to start educating and to start engaging with the public. Because people aren't like, you, you know, people are busy, they have lives to live, they don't really care unless you can make it concrete about how it's going to impact them and ideally how it's going to benefit them. And, you know, and if it's not going to, then maybe rethink the program and rethink what you're trying to accomplish if it's not really going to be helping people within the city live their lives better. Uh, but like, if you can't articulate what you're trying to achieve in a way that is accessible to everyone in your community, 
then you still have a lot of work to do that, you know, it's, it's not enough to just say like, we want to make the world a better place. You need to have some idea of how that's going to happen. And I think that's part of like why we try to build into our process some of these questions around, right? Like, who do you expect to use the open data? Who might use it in a different way? Because sometimes you just shift the mentality and think not just about the sort of the positive folks, but the folks who might um, take it for in unintended directions. And then start thinking about places where maybe, um, you know, you're really aligning the purposes that you're trying to achieve um, with the safeguards, with the data itself, and with the kinds of people that you're engaging with. And I think that that's, it, it's a hard process. It, it's definitely like, this is what um, organizations do every day. And it's a lot of soul searching, but it's really important. And I think that's also the basis for those conversations. And it's a good way to, to hone your own thinking is to, to workshop and to communicate with the public. Um, and I think exactly as I was saying, um, particularly folks who don't have an, an opportunity to already be part of these conversations and to really stretch yourself to think diversely um, about the people that it might be impacted. And that's not always the people using the technology. It's the people who are, um, you know, this is a connected environment and things that, um, you know, impact trust and uptake on one end, you know, for one technology will impact people's responses for any number of other ones. So that I think just to totally agree with everything that you were saying there, but um, particularly focusing on purposes, I think is a useful strategy. Rafael? Yeah, I would say that Sao Paulo is really a laboratory for this kind of experimentations as well. Like, like let's remember, I remember two cases in which I participated in, which was really interesting, this uh, discussion about the risks and the benefits of using that, that type of data. For instance, when, remember in 2000, the end of 2015, when City Hall was designing the new regulatory model for Uber and other firms, like 99 and other tech firms that were operating with ride sharing. They designed a very interesting model of in which the tech firm would pay a, a price to use uh, the road, the public roads, but they were also interesting, interested in producing incentives for these tech firms to make sure that they would put on the streets car that would not pollute, they would put on the streets uh, drivers with a certain amount of uh, hours the drivers could ride, so they could not be exhausted in driving for more than 14 hours and hitting the cars, and also interested in making sure that, that those drivers and these new markets would operate in the poor neighborhoods as well, the periphery. And in order to understand that, they needed uh, a system of data sharing from the tech firms to the city hall. And there was a discussion about what, what was precisely the, the types of data that you needed to do this kind of aggregate analysis of public policy, in which you want to make sure that you have cars that are polluting, polluting less and go into the periphery and making sure that you also have gender equality between men and women driving. Uh, and there were a lot, a lot of risks in like, do you really need the ident identification of the driving licensing uh, in order to assess that? Because if you have poor information security systems or transportation of, or of data that is not encrypted, you can put in risks uh, in risk of this, this whole set of drivers that could be assessed for new business later on, or they could be identified as drivers of Uber and that could be any potential abusive uses of those, of those data. And I remember three years later, and we had that discussion with the city hall and the members like, do you, do you really need this uh, data set? What, what is precisely you need because of the reasons you were regulating? Um, and later on, there was this really interesting discussion about the, the, the new uh, public Wi-Fi program in Sao Paulo. So remember that previously, uh, Fernando Haddad had a model, the mayor had a model in which you didn't need to provide any personal data at all in order to access internet in public uh, squares. This was the public Wi-Fi program. And then the city hall changed their idea because they needed investment from the private sector. So they came up with a business model in which advertisers would invest money in the infrastructure so they could also make sure that people would watch some advertisement in order to have access of the open Wi-Fi. And there was a lot of discussion. I participated when I was at EDAC discussing with the technical team of the city hall when, what was the types of personal data or data that they needed in order to achieve the, the goals that they wanted to achieve. And basically, they wanted to achieve 
measurement of the quality of the network. So they didn't need like this personal data. And they were not interest, interested in doing profiling of the types of citizens that were watching the advertisers. They just needed to know that the person actually watched the adver advertisement for one minute or two minutes. So they, bas they basically needed like uh, less data and just the metadata of the device to make sure that the person connected and then watched the advertisement and were, were connected and then the, the quality of the Wi-Fi connection. And I remember they were they had the idea of um, storing the data, the metadata for five years. And then I said, why are you guys doing this? Why do you, why do you intend to store for five years? And they said, well, because we've read this provision in the internet frameworks, uh, the legislation, it talks about storing for a period of time. And th that's the reason, it's just a reference. And we were like, but if you just need to, to measure the quality for the period of one year, just store the data for one year. You know, think about the life cycle. Uh, it's risky to, to store the data for more. The problem is that these experiences, in my opinion, they were like learning by doing without a strong methodology. You know, that's why I'm so interested in what uh, Kelsey presented here, because I do think there's a lot of room for building the methodologies to do this in like, like a methodological and continuous way. Because right now it's a mess, like city halls are experimenting and trying to measure with their own methodologies, but the, the methodological debate uh, matters a lot. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, we are uh, running, out, running out of time here. Uh, I'd like you to uh, present your final comments regarding not only your presentation, but the, the questions that uh, the audience uh, presented to us. Especially uh, a final remark that you would like to, to share with our, our audience regarding this topic. What would be a good first step or uh, not only a good first step, what would be a, a good measure to uh, promote awareness regarding uh, open data and uh, its relationship with uh, privacy laws or data protection? Let us start with uh, Kelsey, after that, uh, Rafael and uh, Anna could close our event to us. Kelsey? Yeah, thank you. Well, and, and you know, just to say that this has been a really fantastic conversation. I like the uh, way that you brought together sort of all these different components and all the options, because I think a lot of times people um, see one model and they get blinders and they sort of only focus on how do I make this thing work and they, they're not thinking about the broader goals that they're trying to achieve and I think that um, you know exploring the co-ops and the data trusts and the open data like, portals and all of the other options that are out there is great and, and I think will help drive us in the right direction. Um, you know I think in terms of promoting awareness in terms of pulling all these things together I'm you know I, it has been really instructive to me to see the response to COVID-19 in terms of data as infrastructure um, to bring us all the way back to Raphael's initial point. And the situations in which in emergency situations where we do need data to be shared and to be um, used for the public benefit in a way that I think is a lot easier for everybody to agree what the public benefit means, um, it's been really helpful in places that have had clear regulatory infrastructure and have had um, experienced um, staff and operational processes in place before the situation. So um, contact tracing was happening in Europe long before uh, it was happening in the US and places where at the local level, we don't have a clear regulatory structure. There aren't real answers. Every city is developing and experimenting on their own. And that lack of, um, you know, a process to follow, the lack of um, ability to have confident decision making has really been um, a challenge. But I think this is also an opportunity where the public can really see for once the value of having open data. And they can also see the consequences of not getting it right, to Anna's point, um, where you know you, you can understand and you can have a conversation that's really tangible about um, what individuals can learn and why it's important for government to be shining a light on its own activities, um, but also why it's so important um, to take a step, to take a second and protect individual privacy at that time. So I think don't waste a crisis, like use this as a learning opportunity, both organizationally and with the public. I think that it, you can make it tangible and, and impactful and that we're in a time when privacy and data protection um, really are things that people are starting to think about in a way that they haven't before. So just to say, this is a great opportunity, looking forward to continuing on the conversation um, you know, afterwards. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael. 
I would like to first, first of all, uh, thank you guys for making this conversation about this topic, and especially with Ciro Biderman, who is a, a pioneer, as I told you, in this field. It's inspirational for everyone trying to think outside the box and make sure that we can perceive data as this common infrastructure and also an open, uh, an open space for innovation and to reduce inequalities. This is very important because it frames the debate in terms of economic democracy, which is something that as lawyers, we do not perceive clearly when we're talking about personal data. We usually talk about privacy rights and personal data protection. Sometimes we become too attached with the idea of just protecting and making sure that people can exercise those rights. And I think that the, the debate on, on public administration and innovation and progressive economics on this topic um, is also an opportunity to, to understand what will, will be the economy in the 21st century and how can we build more opportunity to get new uses of data and to decentralize the use of data among the community. It's also an opportunity to, at the same time, reinforce the values of trust and participation and solidarity. At the same time that you can open up the space to use economically, you can open the conversation to measure risks and to make sure that the community care about themselves, like the whole community. So it's also an opportunity to reinforce this democratic um, attachment that we have among ourselves. I think this is truly inspirational for the coming years. And I think this is also an opportunity to think about progressive politics in the local level, which is an open, an open venue for uh, next year in Sao Paulo and other cities. So thanks a lot for having uh, the opportunity to share uh, our ideas on this. Thanks, Pacheco. Thank you very much, Rafael. Anna? Thank you very much for having me. It's a great discussion. And thank you, Kelsey. This is, I'm very interested in your work. And Raphael, the part of your presentation that I caught has been very insightful. And um, uh, well, I think open data has been with us for like 20 years as a concept and a practice. And I think uh, we still have a lot to learn about how to do this. And I still think that data trust is a worthy option, though, like I said, it's quite costly and it might require much more effort than opening, like than putting the data in the public domain, which is relatively cheap, relatively easy. Um, and I would, I would just reiterate my point about transparency and public engagement. And there's been a lot of talk about transparency. This is a very uh, complex issue, but all of us, we need to, to, to try and uh, make this conversation as, as transparent as possible to understand how, how these uh, practices work, how, what, kind of, um, what kind of data is used, how it's used, where it travels, and uh, what municipalities get, get out of it, what the public gets out of it. Defining the public purpose in understanding what exactly each of the parties is gaining is essential because quite often, surprisingly, it's not done. We just do something and we deal with the problems down the road. And this is the wrong approach. So thank you very much and good luck. And I look forward to learning more about each of your work. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank, thanks, Rafael. Thanks, uh, Kelsey. I think, that, I think that's all for today. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, see you next time uh, with us in another uh, event, in another conference. So goodbye.